Great. Okay. Um, my name is Andrew Simon, um, and I'm a director of Immerse. Uh, thanks again for joining this meeting or the, joining us this evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories we are all virtually gathered on. Um, I'm joining you from Galliano Island, uh, the traditional territories of Penelicate, Kalitsum, and Swasson, as well as other Halkomitnam speaking peoples. Um, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share this experience with you all this evening. Um, so I realize we're all tuning in actually from different parts of the region. So how about we all just take a moment to type into the chat a land acknowledgement of your own. It can be very simple. Just be nice to get a sense for everyone is joining us from this evening. And uh, yeah, well, welcome to Micro Explorations, our first um, scanning electron microscope outreach program sponsored by Hitachi, UBC, UBC, and the Institute for Multidisciplinary Ecological Research in the Salish Sea, or IMMERSE. Uh, Immerse is a nonprofit organization that was founded to set an example for community-based long-term ecological research here in the Salish Sea bioregion. Our vision is to foster a resilient and interconnected Salish Sea. Uh, and our mission is to create capacity for diverse communities to participate in this vision through the practice of observing the natural world around us and establishing biodiversity baselines to better understand the ecological ch change that is upon us. Uh, so in this series, we'll be bringing together the wonderful Dr. Elaine Humphrey with various experts uh, to explore a variety of topics in natural history um, through the lens of a scanning electron microscope. These sessions are intended to be open-ended and participatory, guided by your questions, um, our observations, and the insights of our experts who are joining us. So please don't hesitate to share or ask any questions you might have about what you're seeing at any point. Also, uh, we're always looking for ideas and guest experts to join us. So please let us know at the end of the session if you have a topic you'd like to propose. So yeah, essentially this evening, we're just going to look very closely at the microorganisms that make their home on blades of eelgrass using a, a scanning electron microscope. Uh, we'll see lots of interesting things that, that are normally completely invisible to us, uh, which we can all uh, interrogate and ask questions about. And our experts here this evening will have the opportunity to interpret what we're seeing. The session will run about an hour until 8 p.m., uh, though it may go a little bit longer depending on how engaged everybody is. Um, yeah, so before we get started, I'd just like to introduce to you our facilitators this evening. So we have the Dr. Elaine Humphrey joining us from the Advanced Microscopy Facility at UVic. Um, Mark Weber, who's been studying diatoms uh, in this Salish Sea for the last decade here on Galliano Island, and Siobhan Schenk, who's a PhD candidate at UBC, where she is exploring the microbial communities that make their home on eelgrass, as well as sugar kelp, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, I'm actually going to take uh, invite each one of you, Elaine, Mark, Siobhan, to just introduce yourselves briefly. Please tell us a little bit about your background and, and what we're going to be looking at this evening. We'll start with... Um, uh, no, I, I think I'll... My background is going to come in as as we talk. Okay, sounds good. How about um, we? How about Mark? Would you like to introduce yourself? You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark Weber, uh, same as Elaine. I uh, will maybe become a parent, but uh, live on Galliano Island and uh, have been uh, studying uh, diatoms um, as a kind of a passion, hobby, interest. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Elaine and some others. And uh, last year uh, began a study uh, with uh, the Parfrey Lab and Siobhan and Laura Parfrey and Emily uh, studying uh, eelgrass. And we're looking at the uh, diatoms. We're also looking at all the microbial community. It's a fascinating project. And uh, over here we have a lab and uh, with light microscopy. And uh, one of the things I do over here is prepare the the uh, stubs for the electron microscope, prepare the samples, as well as uh, uh, slides, um, and also we're working on mapping, and that will, we'll talk about that later. But anyways, very brief um, summary. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Siobhan, would you like to share a little bit about your, your background and how you came to be here with us this evening? Sure, so I am a PhD student in the Perfrey Lab, and how I initially got involved with Immerse was through a project with uh, actually Mark, Elaine, and Andrew has been helping with this project. And it was started by another PhD, 
D. Candate in the Harvey Lab, Emily Adamchak, who's also a member of MERS. So we're looking at the microbial communities, so that's the diatoms, the bacteria, and the microscopic eukaryotes that live on seagrass. And like Andrew mentioned, I also study sugar kelp. And the reason for studying this microbial community, besides that it's really cool, is that it's very important for the health of kind of the host organism. So you can think about um, what the bacteria that are living on you or the seagrass might have on the effect of the host. Yeah. Mark, I see uh, Melanie's come. Yeah, Melanie is there somewhere. Melanie is is one of the volunteers who knows a lot about diatoms. Hello. <laughs> awesome, Melanie. Hey, Melanie. Thanks for joining us. I see we have Nikki right here is also specialized in eelgrass communities and has dedicated a lot of her life to that work. So it'd be great to have her insight as well. Awesome. Well, I'll just let you take it away then, Elaine, from here. I think you have some slides and stuff to share before we hop in. Right. I've got about four slides uh, just to show you, just to get you in the mood for where you need to be. And if I can, um, can somebody get that? Yep, you got it. <laughs> Okay, uh, oh, I need to share my screen. Hold on a second. Uh, share screen, this one here and here. Can you all see my screen? You got it. Okay, so eelgrass beds, here they are. They look like grass, right? And sometimes they look very clean. And sometimes, and so this is what we get, but this is what we get. This is what we get sometimes. And, oh, and this, so uh, we were out in the sailboat and along comes a piece of eelgrass floating by. And I picked it up, put it on the deck, dried it out, put it in the microscope, no processing, no nothing, just dried eelgrass. And that's what we're gonna look at tonight because it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's. Every time we look, we find another. Are we about 40 species now, Mark? Yeah, actually, we've just gone over 40, 40, 42 genera, not species, 42 genera. OK, but know, often um, I'm talking, I'm talking to kids. Oh, no, nobody got it. OK, often I'm, um, I'm talking to kids. And so instead of talking about scientific names, which we do enjoy because they can be tongue twisters, we talk about them as what do they remind you of? So we have frisbees, pillows, canoes, biscottis, French fries, matchsticks, uh, Toblerones, Kinder surprises, and things like that. Yeah. So I am going to ask you at some point, what does it remind you of? Because we're adding to the list. Um, this is what we look at a lot. And all I can say is, I am so glad I'm not the person to count them. <laughs> Okay, so I think that was, yeah. So now I'm going to share, if I can get this up at the top, I'm gonna to share this little microscope. So I have now, can, oh yeah. You, so you can see, no, that's the, that's the, hold on. That's the little PowerPoint. Get rid of you. Yeah, the little tiny microscope. So this is a little, tiny microscope and if I turn my screen down so you can see it I can see this is this is the eelgrass all dried down and cut up into little pieces and then this is a little USB uh, Celestron uh, microscope and and this is what we can see uh, wait a minute, going the wrong way because it's backwards so you can see not a lot it looks like a well, it looks like something unrepeatable. Uh, I can make it lower and then focus here. But you can't really tell one species from another with this kind of microscope. So now we're going to share the screen. I'm going to stop sharing on this one. And we're going to go and learn how to use a scanning electron microscope. But this has to be one of the easiest scanning electron microscopes we've got. So Hitachi microscope. I'll move you over here. 
and I'll put you, oh no, I got to be able to talk to you, so I need to put you there. Um, and uh, share screen and then share the screen here. So you should be able to see. Um, so this is the screen of the microscope. Oh, I should show you what the microscope looks like. So it's a bit like a, a large desktop microscope. Uh, a large, I mean, desktop computer. And at the front, if I can move you around without making you sick. Um, oh, no, that way down. Oh, it's got two knobs on it for X and Y control. So they gave me, but they gave it to me, so I can't complain really, um, a minimalist uh, microscope. It doesn't have a motorized stage and the newer ones do. But hey, you can't, as I say, you can't complain, it's a, a gift. So, uh, but they're so easy to use and we get six year olds to use them all the time. So you go to the top left hand corner and you see the start button and you click on the start button and you just wait for a little while. And this is a refresher for Mark because Mark's getting this microscope for a couple of weeks while I'm on holiday uh, up at the top of Galliano. So I guess you have to go sweet talk Mark if you want to go play with it. Um, uh, and here's the piece of eelgrass. And you don't see a great deal until you zoom in. So let's zoom in. Uh, and there's all those um, diatoms that are, um, and I'll do, that's pretty much in focus. So we got a lot, we got a ton of oval shaped cocoa bean micro, uh, uh, diatoms. Did and you fix it in any way, Elaine, or did you just throw the grass in the microscope? Just threw it in the microscope. Oh, I did, wow. a, I did actually coat it with gold. Yeah, okay, okay, but I was gonna say, yeah. Because, but you can get away with this microscope without coating it, uh, but you lose resolution when you do that. And, and since I wanted to see these things um, a lot um, easier, and that's a little bit out of focus, but we just over here, I'll just minimize that, autofocus, make it easy, auto brightness and contrast. All these little white crystals are the seawater salt. Uh, so they, uh, but on that page, we can see one, two, three, four different species. So there's these uh, coconeus, the coca bean ones, but then there's these ones here. Uh, oh, is that a biscotti, Mark? Did we decide that was, a, and this one up here could be a biscotti? It uh, could be. Yeah, I think the lower one looks like a biscotti, probably a catenula. Yeah. Still, and then this, still this, haven't confirmed that genera. And this one up here is a canoe. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but you can see there's a difference in sizes. And these uh, cocoa bean ones are one of the smaller ones. Uh, so, but also on this thing, suddenly you see all kinds of other things. Let me just do an auto brightness and contrast. I just move this over with the X and Y controls. And look at this. We've got a couple of things here. Um, this thing here, uh, well, the kids decided it was a burst balloon or a balloon not blown up or I thought it was more like a hot water bottle. And if I put it in here, and you can see it's feeding on diatoms and it's a tintinid. Is that cool? Wow. And it's got another one on here. Now, did we decide that was an amphora? It's got diatoms in its mouth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're kind of smaller than the, well, I suppose there's some small ones here too. Um, but oh, there's a different species. Um, but this one here, is that, did we decide that's an amphora? That's an amphora for yes. sure. Yes. Yep. Okay. And, got and, two confirmations on that. And French fry in there. That's French fry. And there's a long arrow. Okay. Uh, oh, but these guys here, let me move it over. There. Whoops. Uh, oh, so we, it's a bit bright, so we do an auto brightness contrast. Um, now, these guys got kinder surprises uh, as what they looked like, uh, but also a Christmas cracker. What did we decide these ones were? Marshmallows. Marshmallows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let Melanie go first there. 
we need to, we need to zoom in a little bit to see there's there's two possibilities on that one uh, now in order to focus on here oh um oh i've got two people coming in uh, admit oh pam's it's pam i'll and, take care of those ones elaine you just keep on rocking uh so um i think i got them but we take the reduced window because we want to focus in here uh, we'll take a focus. What are we at? We're only at 800. Um, hmm. We got lines on the screen, so something. Oh, I forgot to tighten it up. Uh, shoot. But that could be charging, so that I need to um, focus a bit more. Any ideas, M Melanie? Yeah, Melanie, you go for it. Get the species, Melanie. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't do the, the the species on that, but that looks like a Bedelphia to me. Bedelphia. Okay. Oh, and then this, look at those collars. Look at those collars there, Melanie. Oh, Odontella. Yeah. Odontella. No, I think. Oh, okay. You do it. Okay. Oh, Sarah. But over here, over here, we have Lewis. Uh, the kids decided that this guy was called Lewis. Because uh, they get to name them sometimes, and so this is a copepod. And most of the things that we see are also in pond life, and you get copepods in pond life too. Uh, so we do a slow scan. Um, and this guy, um, the tail, there's the tail, and the abdomen, and the thorax. And then copepods that have very long antenna are herbivores. Kobe pods with short antenna are carnivores. So this guy is a predator. Uh, we won't stay long on the, the, the idea of Kobe pods is um, you can talk about them with the kids because they're ones with the squishy stuff inside and the hard stuff outside. And we have our squishy stuff on the outside and our hard stuff inside. And if you have your hard stuff outside, you still have to be able to sense where your mate is or where your food is or whether it's hot or cold or whether it's fresh or salty enough for you so um let me just um brighten that up a bit um so i'm gonna go over here to another piece suddenly our number of species just increased and this is on the same piece of it's just I cut the piece up so I uh, let me see we need an auto focus see what, what I mean it's so easy auto brightness and contrast and a slow scan so the way an electron microscope works is the electron beam comes down the column very tiny tin pinpoint of a beam hits the specimen and kicks out secondary electrons and they are picked up by the secondary electron detector the detector doesn't move and the specimen doesn't move. It's the beam that moves across in a raster fashion, hence the name scanning electron microscope. But here we've got those um, marshmallow marshmallows. I like that. Uh, marshmallows and lots of coconuts and lots of matchsticks and French fries um, and so on. Okay, so we go back. But the trouble is if you try and move when you're in slow, um, it, you have to wait for the whole thing to go through to see what your real estate is looking like. So you go to fast and then you can move things in real time. Um, so we're now going to go to my favorites. You'll like these. If you're an artist, you'll like these. Because these are the Toblerones. There's a bunch of them here. They're little triangles. So they have a lovely scientific name, Trigonium. See, I learned that really early on but I like Toblerones better. And they're all out of focus. So we're gonna go, ah, oh, that may, may be a problem. So we'll use the reduced window and we will go auto focus. Okay. And now if we zoom into this guy and you see the pattern, look at that, is that cool? So when you, when you ask the kids, what does it remind you of? Uh, they said uh, roses, um, flowers, gummy bears. Hmm. 
Now, if you're an artist, you would be, or you might could doodle at, I suppose. We'll take a bit. And this bit, this stuff on the side here. Now, first of all, we should tell you why diatoms are so important to us. And that's because they're going to provide 20 to 50% of the world's oxygen. So trees are all very good because one tree can keep four people alive. But diatoms, 50% of the world's oxygen, when it's blooming, is quite a lot. So they're really quite important to us. But when they die, they form these little bits. And that's diatomaceous earth. I did have uh, four reasons why diatomaceous earth is important to us, but I forgot one. The uh, function of the perforations on the shell, is this how it interferes with the environment or? Well, imagine you've got hard bits on the outside and you need to get oxygen in and out and you need to get nutrients in and out. So they're pores. They're pores. And organic? They're, organic but there's, organ garden. there's an organic layer over the surface, which you can't see because it's come away. Uh, and most people who um, tell you what type of diatom it is, try and get rid of that organic layer so they can see the holes. And you can tell one species from another by the pattern of the holes. So, so um, organic. Right, it looks like there's about five or six holes in each of the bigger holes. Yeah, and they have a name. I mean, you know, diatom people give it a name. Uh, pass. Creole who? Areoli. Areoli. Yeah. So there's, yeah, tiny, tiny holes within holes uh, for gas exchange and nutrient exchange. And uh, they're very complex, actually. And the no, structure is well, very complex. Down the are they active transporter pores or are they just really just holes? No, they've got an, a me an organic membrane over them in, <laughs> and through. But at one point down the hot corridor, we have a focused iron beam, a fib. So we fib a lot in this lab and um, it cuts things in the nanoscale. And one day I could see both screens from the SEM, the S4800 and the fib. And at one point they both had the same pattern on the screen. Now the fib was cutting 50 to, nine, uh, 50 to uh, 80, 90 nanometer holes in arrays. And the SEM was looking at diatoms. It was Jamie Mark on the, on the right. SEM looking at diatoms. And the person who was using the, making the holes in gold on glass on the fib was making them for optical sensors. So suddenly they have the same pattern. So suddenly Mohammed, who was working on the fib is looking at Jamie and saying, they must be controlling the wavelength of light that goes through the holes. So they, most diatoms live, have a particular um, place they like to live. And maybe that's how, there's not about nine different chlorophylls, each one having an optimal wavelength of light for them. So it's possible that they're also optimizing what wavelengths of light go through into the chlorophyll, through the holes. They're very tiny. Um, so the scale bar at the bottom, um, oh, Milton, the scale bar at the bottom goes from the one end to the other end is 20 micrometers. So if you think of a millimeter and divide it by a thousand, you have a micrometer. If you take the micrometer and divide it by a thousand, you have a nanometer. And if you take the nanometer and divide it, oh, a, a, I should tell you a bacterium is about one to five micrometers and a virus is about 30 nanometers. Now you take the nanometer and divide it by a thousand and you have a picometer. And a, a, we're in the atomic scale now and a silicon atom is about 235 picometers. And the big microscope down the corridor it did have a resolution at one point of 37 picometers, but then they put the repeater on the roof, which, ugh. so we can get 60 picometers out of it, relatively easy, 50, working at it. Um, so, um, yeah, so with this, with this scale bar, between each 
it's divided into 10 parts. So between the first part and the second part is a 10th, so it's two micrometers. So that's about the size, of, well, as I say, a, a bacterium is about what, one to, one to five micrometers. Well, Brett, you could tell us that, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I was trying to see the scale bar, thanks. Okay, um, all right. So uh, did I mention this is the gift that keeps on giving? So we should just go over here now. And, and this guy is a skeleton shrimp, a caprolid amphipod. And he's a bit out of focus, but he's got cool features on him. So amphipods are flattened like a book. They usually swim on their side. Amphi means different and pod means legs. So all the legs are different. And if you go to the beach and you pick up a rock, amphipods will be the sand fleas that are jumping around. They're amphipods. I'm not the same as this one. This one's a skeleton shrimp um, rather than a sand flea. Um, auto brightness and contrast. But if we look at his back, is the back of this guy has got a lot of diatoms on it. And the seawater, of course, has crystallized out because it was sitting on the deck drying in the sun. And you know, as you know, seawater is salty, sodium chloride, but sodium chloride under the SEM looks like little cubes. But nobody told this one it was supposed to be a little cube. And this one here, oh, let's just do an autofocus on that. We're not seeing it very well. This guy here, is about <clears throat> uh, a dodecahedron dice that the kids play the games with on the board games that they have, which I think is kind of cool, which tells you that seawater does, isn't just sodium and chlorine. There's a lot more elements in it besides that. Okay, let's go back to fast. And, oh, so can you see the size of that little tiny, a capellid amphipod. Well, if we move right across to the next piece, a bit further, it comes up a bit too low. Yeah, here's another one. This is a little bit bigger. And they're kind of cool. You can see this with your naked eye. <coughs> they hang on by their back legs and they wave about. In the, in the water and capture things. Um, but there's the antenna and there's the head and it's a little eye. With a light microscope, you can see the eye, but you can't see the eye with the scanning electron microscope because it just, oh, it's a bit bright. Um, because um, we're only seeing grayscale. So if you think of the rainbow, it splits white light into all its different wavelengths. So the blue end is the short wavelengths and all the colors in between are just a different wavelength till the red end. The red end is the long wavelengths. And we used to be able to see another color. We used to be, a, no, not used to. When, when they made the first artificial lenses for eyes, people started saying, but I can see this other color. And it was a UV color uh, because they didn't have the filter for the UV. Um, until, and then they found out, well, UV is kind of damaging. So they uh, put filters in the lenses. So, but have you ever tried to tell somebody what red looks like? It's kind of difficult. So they couldn't tell you what it looks like, but um, all the legs are different. So this is an amphipod. An isopod is flattened like a dinner plate. And iso means the same and pod means legs. So an isopod, like a wood bug, um, is in, in the forest eating the wood um, would be an isopod. And there's a big isopod called Ligia that lives in the ocean uh, that you might find on pilings. Um, but if I go, um, am I at the lowest? Yeah, I'm at the lowest. If I go a bit further, I put a real adult on. Uh, we had our boat out the water and this thing was clinging uh, to the bottom. Uh, to the, the weed that was growing on the bottom. So this is its head. 
and the antenna, they can be quite big. You can see this, it's got lots of sensory hairs on its hard bits. And its abdomen and its claws for capturing things. And then up to its hind legs, which uh, are huge. So it's quite, quite big. Um, it's a bit dark, let's just lighten this up a bit. See how easy it is to use a scanning electron microscope. I love this thing. Um, okay, so let's go, let's go back to our, um, our guy over here. Elaine, did you mention that um, folks involved in this study are actually counting the individual diatoms along the blade of the eelgrass? No, I didn't need to do that because Sean's going to do that. Siobhan's going to do that. No, but you said that indeed that is what this, they are doing. Is that true? Have, I'm curious how many individual diatoms have been found on like per, per square centimeter, let's say. We haven't got there yet. Okay. We decided that, in all, see, look at this one. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, Andrew, we're in the thousands. Per square centimeter? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, that's a 500 micro, micrometer um, scale bar. So a half a millimeter. There's a thousand micrometers to a millimeter. Start okay. counting. Andrew. Are you going to start counting? <laughs> Andrew. Uh, uh, so, so this is where Siobhan comes in. Because uh, um, one of her jobs <laughs> is to find the undergraduate, I think. <laughs> but no, Siobhan's going to do um, a lot of this by barcoding. Uh, so we're going to be able to do this chemically. Uh, um, well, no, Sh Siobhan, uh, counting is hard work. Okay. Um, are you there, Siobhan? I I'm, doing, I'm doing the counting. Melanie's you doing the counting. You're doing the counting? I am here. <laughs> oh, okay. So tell us about the barcoding. Sure. So essentially, barcoding gets kind of really complicated really quickly, but every organism, so bacteria, the amphipods we're seeing, the diatoms, um, they have conserved parts of DNA sequences. So that is a sequence that's pretty similar across all organisms within that group that you're interested in. So that allows us to amplify, so make a lot of copies of that part of DNA of a huge heterogeneous sample of like, let's say bacteria. If you don't know what the bacteria are, but you know that this region exists, you can get a lot of copies of that DNA sequence and then read that DNA sequence to figure out what species are there. Is a, I don't know if Mark, you have a better, explanation for that, or if you think I missed well, that's, something, that's, that's, that's it's great. nice to be able to draw what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this one's got a raffe slit. So these are plants that can move, which I think is really cool. And they do it because they have a mucilage that exude through the raffe slit. And, and this guy, his, his, his in here, see that slit there? But the thing is, when they have a raffe slit and they have mucilage, they get sticky. And it means that bits stick to them a lot. So Siobhan, when you do your barcoding, how many generous species? I mean, what are you seeing compared to what they're seeing visually? I don't have the sequencing results <laughs> yet. So I can't answer that. Um, I, here's the thing, because we're looking at a specific kind of known sequence of DNA, our primers that are used to amplify that part, um, sometimes miss species, or let's say there's a really rare species that wasn't in the SEM sample and was picked up by the sequencing. That's how you can get mismatch between the like visual accounts and then the molecular data. So 
ideally we would have 100% correspondence, but that's not what I'm expecting. So what are you amplifying? Geek question here. So everyone else plug your ears. Was it ITS yeah. or? So for Diatoms, we went with RBCL because that's what the uh, barcode of life, I think is what right. it's called, project uses. For okay. bacteria, we're using the 16S B4 yeah. region. And then for the eukaryotes, we're doing it 18S. I forget what specific region exactly, actually. Yeah. Thanks. So we have three sets of primers. Okay, um, so in here, so there's, there's our Caproni that are the original one. And somewhere in here, no, but further up. So you can see the matchstick ones. And oh, here's one of the pillar ones, I think. Is this a pillar one or a, yeah, isn't that, um, what are the pillar ones called? This guy here. This window. Go for it, Melanie. Or is it? No, it's a bit like the other ones, isn't it? Oh no, it's an Ishmael, isn't it? Uh, no, uh, it's uh, Adantella Arita. Okay. So we still have those two little, two little, two little horns extensions on the top, and right. two, two yeah. big ocelli on the sides. It's a little broken. Um, oh, then tell it now. Where are we? Coming in here. Okay. So we're just going to go up here to Bob. There's Bob. This is Bob. It's named in Bob. And so this guy is also got short antenna. So of course he's a predator. But this guy is good because when you go in, he's out of focus. So we use the reduced window, autofocus. There we go. And so scan. As well as sensory stuff on the antenna, he's got sensory hairs on his surface. And I think those are for sensing the water movement over the body. Is that cool? But he's got covered in diatomaceous earth. So one good reason for diatomaceous earth is filtering beer. What another one is the First Nations use it for cleaning blankets and for keeping the insects out of blankets. And because I've done a lot with um, wool dog blankets, we found a lot of diatomaceous earth in, it, in them. And one is for gardeners use it to keep insects off their plant, uh, ants off their plants. Um, and that, somebody gave me another one the other day and I've forgotten what it was. Yeah, Elaine, I was gonna say earlier, organic gardeners do use it for all sorts of pest control. And I also heard this week that they use it, you know, to do like, to deal with bed bugs and like uh, shelters and stuff like that. And so it, it's a, it's a, a organic pest fighting material. Great. Oh, yeah. And dynamite. So, and over here. While you're on your way there, my question is, where do they actually find all this diatomaceous earth that like I've got some in my garden shed? How do they mine it? Well, it's usually from a pond. So it's usually fresh water. So the pond accumulates the diatoms in a one place. And as the pond silts up, then it becomes uh, a place where you might go find diatomaceous earth. More so than, um, than the sea. Because he's got all kinds of other things in it too. Yeah, yeah. Huh. There's, there's really big deposits, Pam, in California. Um, oh yeah. Almost, almost mountain sides of it. Uh, wow. A lot. And other places in the world, there's huge deposits of diatomaceous earth. One of the first uses of diatomaceous earth was the making of dynamite, which is where Alfred Nobel huh. uh, made his fortune. So we, we can thank the Nobel Prizes for the 
invention of dynamite, which is nitroglycerin. <laughs> nitroglycerin soaked in diatomaceous earth, so it just doesn't blow you up right away. <laughs> well, minor fact. That's a bit like. That's a bit like um, okay, so when I was in school, we had clover fed the beef. The beef fed the sailors uh, when they were out on long voyages, and um, no, uh, no, the, and the, and the there was bees involved somewhere along the lines, uh, but somewhere along the line there was bees in this li list. But it was a long chain, and it meant that clo no, the bees kept the clover going because of pollinating them, and then the clover fed the beef and the beef fed the sailors and then the sailors uh, so Great Britain became Great Britain because of bees. I think that's how it went in the end. <laughs> so, so it was one of those long chain things yeah. Um, so this guy is an analid and if you think back to your high school uh, dissections of earthworms uh, and they had little holes up the sides Nephridia for the kidneys. Uh, you can just, oh, well, I can make it a bit higher, but yeah, we have the technology. <laughs> make it bigger. So um, you can, yeah. And you can see the segments. But um, so this is not a polykeep, this is an oligokeep, I would assume. I haven't seen any kitty on it, but it hasn't got any long kitty on it. So it's an oligokeep rather than a polykeep. But um, do we have any experts on worms? We could do with somebody. Oh, look, 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 look. There's, there's skeletonema. No, Elaine, you can't have skeletonema. It's plantonic. You, no way. That just isn't, that's skeletonema, isn't it? It is indeed. It is. Yeah, indeed. but this, don't forget this. Pain. This particular piece of eelgrass was floating in the ocean, which makes it planktonic. How much, how much overlap have you seen so far between the planktonic samples you collect versus the epiphytic samples on the eelgrass? Um, not a lot on the eelgrass that we get from the eelgrass beds. So Siobhan and, and Mark were collecting the samples and they used a specific uh, year yearling, two years old. It had to be a specific year, and then they cut it up into proximal, distal, and medial parts. And that and, and Mark processed it, it, gives it to me, and I'm imaging it. And then Siobhan's going to get samples for barcoding. That's the plan at the moment. Uh, but Scott, let's, say, let's say something, Elaine, if I can just interject there, is that yes. following up on Andrew's question, is that we see what are considered to be planktonic diatoms um, in every sample. So, so the, the question becomes, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you say that something is planktonic? And when you see colonies after colonies of skeletonema, uh, we see diplom, which is considered to be planktonic, but I'm seeing... Uh, pieces and frustules of dithlum right now from the summer sample uh, in every single sample, they're frequent. So the question is, are the planktonic diatoms also using the eelgrass um, for uh, reproduction or other mechanisms? So this is, I think is a fascinating question. But there's one of those ones that we were looking at the other day. So the question that Mark pointed out is actually one of the things that the molecular data is really good for because we also took water samples. So if the diatom species of interest is particularly enriched either on eelgrass, so it's mostly found on eelgrass or very abundant on eelgrass and not very abundant in the water or vice versa, you can start to make those kind of distinctions between where um, the diatoms are actually found, so that's the planktonic versus the eelgrass-associated diatoms, and it most likely changes um, with also seasonality. So if we had samples from across the year, you might find 
the relative abundance of different diatom species at different spots to be different. And the age that Elaine talked about before is the different leaf of eelgrass. So eelgrass, um, how you look at the leaf morphology is like the first leaf is gonna be the longest and then you have uh, different ones that grow out from the top. So we sampled the second and third leaf for our study. I have to take this one because this is a new one to me. I was gonna say that Elaine, take that, take it right now. <laughs> I'm taking it. <laughs> we, we can't let this one go by because we might not find it again. <laughs> what is, well, it hasn't got a rough facelet. No, uh, it might be, it might be along the edge, along the keel on the edge. We'll have to take a look at it. It looks like it's um, um, a genera that may have that just around the edge. If we look in the middle, we may see the, the raffae um, along the edge there. Okay. So oh, um, one other thing that, that, that we're working with the, the Parfi lab on is community structure. So we want to also see whether the, the diatoms um, have an organized community structure and patterning uh, spatially and, and across the, um, the eelgrass. So the counting uh, of the genera um, and the using the barcoding uh, and relating it to bacteria and so on will, will begin to reveal whether there's actually organized community uh, structure uh, within the diatoms and between the diatoms and other organisms. So that's really where we're, that's where we're really, really heading. It's a big project. Can you reconstitute the stuff? Can you grow them and you grab a piece of eel water and seagrass, take it back to the lab? Can you grow these things? We sure can. Well, we can, uh, not so much the eelgrass, uh, Brett, but, but uh, when I go after something, I haven't done it recently, but if I want to study something, I'll isolate it on the inverted microscope and pop it into some concentrated growth, uh, saltwater growth media. And if I get fortunate, we can't, we can't clone all of them, but if we get fortunate, we can grow them up and then we've got a couple thousand for the SEM. We can study them a lot better. So if you sequence those and correlate that to the barcodes then, because you're gonna have to do exactly, that, right? Exactly, exactly. That's a major project because some of these benthic and epiphytic diatoms do not um, uh, clone easily. It's a lot of fiddly work to try to get them to, uh, to grow up because they've got specific nutrients, they may even have bacterial associations. And yeah. once you start growing them up, uh, you take that away and uh, some work, some don't. Uh, There's so, another yeah. tint in it. Hidden over. Okay, so let's go up this way. Um, here. And here we've got an ostracod. Just to get this camera. Back. I've once worked on deep sea ostracods a long time ago, but you get them in pond life. This guy. Uh, is that allowed to focus? Oh, we got a peanut. So there's one of the peanuts and the marshmallows. So here, get this one here. So an ostracod is an animal. And it looks a bit like a bivalve, but it it's. It's not, and if you get them from a pond, you can see through them when you put them on the light microscope. And so you can see all the, you can see the heart beating and all the little legs going. And they're a great thing for kids to look at. Well, I'm a big kid now, so I'm on my, it's now that I'm in my second childhood, I can enjoy all kinds of things. Um, but here on this peanut, this peanut one is quite big. Well, well there's one relative to the, to the coconut, the coca bean. But it's got, now did we decide these were amphoras? No, that, that's the one we've, that's the one we're working on right now among, among about 30, 20 other genera. But this one is, um, if we can go in a lane right into the middle where that dip is, um, it's either um, a triblyonella or Samodictylon, and it has to do with the rat, the structure of the raffae slit here. Are we talking about this slit here? Well, the big, the big diatom here. 
these are these are amphora, navicula, but but right in here, right in there. Oh, you're not seeing my finger, but, no. but where the indentation is <laughs> uh, in the, in the fiddle shape, uh, that's really important. But because the the lines, the striae, uh, are so fine, yeah, um, in in number, it's likely um, uh, to be um, tribe Lionella. But we're still working on the difference between the two genera, so haven't decided yet. Okay, so it's a peanut. A peanut is actually easier. Yes. Yes. Um, actually, so one of the you, kids decided. Can you, take, that, can you take that? That's a really useful photograph, Elaine. That's great. I have that one. Oh, um, yeah. So this is an amphora. That's an amphora. And this one's an amphora. Uh, yeah, and looks this, like this it. This one's an avicula. Uh, looks like it. Yeah. That'd be but a likely. That'd be a likely guess. It would suggest to me that this one can move quite a lot because it's got a lot of stuff stuck to it. Yeah. Well, they've got this very sticky um, uh, exterior, uh, exterior organic coating over the, over the pores and the areoli. Uh, we've imaged that before, right, Elaine? We've actually peeled it back. And um, it's actually really small. It's about uh, 500 nanometers thick, that organic casing on the surface where there's lots of bacteria uh, and, and viruses and so on. Right. Oh, there's a little trigonium. Uh, a Toblerone. Um, and there's there's some uh, bits. <laughs> and this is a leg from one of the big capellid amphipods. Yeah. Um, so, and there's another, more bits of capellid amphipod. So there's a lot of capellid amphipods attached to this. Um, so amphipods, copepods, ostracods, um, annelids, tintinids, and lots and lots and lots of diatoms. <laughs> okay. Uh, we could go on an adventure and check, look at something I haven't looked at. You know, so every, so when I, every time I look at this, we see something different, right? Elena, are a lot of these grazers here because there are diatoms on the eelgrass or would they be there anyways? Well, we don't find them on the ones that Mark has, do we? No, we don't. It's really something. It's really something. Not not even one. But I've seen them with a light microscope, but we haven't seen any yet show up in the um, one, two, a few now three, environmental four, samples. Five, six, seven tintinids. That's a question. Yeah. Or we, another, we, another aniline. Yeah. The the samples from Montague Harbor are are very very different. Well, um, so Sydney Spit off Sydney. Um, is a lovely sandy beach and in in the little lagoon area there's a lot of eelgrass beds so Pam um, they were planting eelgrass on Saturna Island um, I got that from from your um, yeah. yeah the uh, Sikh school I think was doing that as a project um martin is that who sent you that or did i send that yeah i'm pretty sure it was the the saturn ecological uh education school those kids it yeah. was their project aha uh -huh. so how when did they start um putting them in <laughs> um i have actually no idea but I could find out for you. I mean, I was thinking, how uh, old, how old uh, are the plants? Um, it, they, did, they did it this year. They did it this year. Okay. There's a lot of eelgrass on Saturna that's been documented already, but not. This is the first time it's been planted, I think. And Mark and Siobhan, are the eelgrass beds? on outside Montague Harbor, are they spreading? I don't know. I don't know. Don't know. I think we were only just now recently getting some ex mapping of the extent of those beds at Montague because the Galliano Conservancies, I guess uh, either Nikki or you could chat with Rob, Rob Underwood 
or Underhill rather at the Maine Conservancy might be able to answer that question. Okay. Um, well, we, we've only got like four minutes left. <laughs> I, I clock out here. Um, well, we could go on an adventure to have a look at one of the other pieces on the other side that I have to actually look at. I got adventure, <laughs> adventure. <laughs> All right. <sighs> Um, I'll just tell you while we're looking, the trust did a lot of eelgrass mapping um, maybe eight to ten years ago, six years ago, something like that, all around the islands. Yeah, uh, this is Nikki. I'm just writing a note, but I don't type as fast as I speak. Uh, this is from Sea Change. And yeah, about um, 2000. And 12 to 2014, we looked for the presence or absence of eelgrass all around the 13 islands and the island trust. We also identified areas for restoration. So Lyle Harbor was the eelgrass transplant just done in early summer this year with those students. And Saturna Beach, we tried some transplanting as well. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. We will have to keep an eye on them. Yes, that's right. We monitor them every six months. Okay, so these are huge relative to the one in the background. That, that, oh, yeah. Mel Melanie, Melanie, what would you say on that? Ifmia? You know she's on. Yes, yes, that looks like Ismithia. Ismithia. <laughs> yeah, nervosa. Hey, eh? nervosa? See those? I don't know the species, sorry. Yeah, the the um, those veins. The okay, veins. Aunt Melanie, I know you don't have a lisp. Uh, what was that again? <laughs> Ismithia. <laughs> Ismithia. Yeah, I S M T H something like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we haven't recorded that on the eelgrass, but we recorded it from Spanish Hill Wharf, Trincomalee, but we have not uh, found those on our samples yet. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So they're really uh, distinctive. I know That's a great about. image, Elaine. Nice one. That's a great image. A huge. That goes in the atlas, Elaine. Yeah, you could probably see these uh, with the naked eye. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great imaging. That's a great image. Well, too far. Uh, a little That's bit beautiful. Actually, I'm not sure that is nervous. Still got some of the organics in that. Want a bit more contrast. So what's the end game? Match as many as you can and basically get an atlas of all the inhabitants of eelgrass? Yeah. Where, where, where are we going with all this? Oh, well, well, there's several, there's a couple of projects on the go, but um, we're, we're trying to make an atlas with lots of, we have some beautiful pictures taken on, mostly on the S4800, the, the microscope down the corridor, because we can use tilt. This one hasn't, hasn't got the motorized stage, but the S4800 is a field emission scanning electron microscope with one nanometer resolution. And so it can, the stage can tilt, and we can rotate. Um, so we've been taking some really, oh, and, and I've got this new technique now. Do you remember the dinoflagellate cysts? The 66 million, so the, I have a PhD student who takes rock from a lot of the island, sun, from the sandstone rock uh, around the islands and he dissolves the rock away and is left with the dinoflagellate cysts, which are like, Fabergé eggs with lots of sculpturing around the outside. They're beautiful. And he's got one, he, he developed this thing on a, um, a pin. So you take a, one of the entomology pins and you cut the little top off and then you glue your diatom on the top. And I've made some pins and I'm ready to do this now, Mark. So we're going to take, I mean, Ishmael, this one would be really good for that kind of thing. If I could get a clean one. It'd be great. Yeah. So we can rotate it round uh, and, and uh, 
and, and get some really cool images. But this has still got a lot of organics in it. You, you can see a lot oh. of the organic layer in there, but it's got areoli. When are areoli, crib, you call something crib something. The, the cribba, the cribba, there's an, there's a, in, often, very often these pores have an internal um, light silica structure, which is highly complex and diverse, which is actually unique to the different genera. And that cribba is inside those pores. So if we look uh, carefully, I don't know if this genera has, has, has cribba, but it actually has a very complex inner pore structure, which we can look at, but it's not a clean, we haven't cleaned the organic matter off, so we may not see it too clearly, but it is there. When you think this is a single cell. Yeah. Um, this is like amazing. So to, to um, just to help uh, Brett, Brett, your question there. Yeah, Elaine took a little diversion into microscopes. She did to do that. <laughs> I'm really excited about the dinoflagellates, which is an incredible paper. I must say that work on extracting dinoflagellates is just fantastic. But so what we're doing is right now, what we're doing is a number of things. We're actually um, morpholo through morphology, determining the genera um, of the diatoms, both the frequent ones and the occasional and the very rare ones. Um, uh, uh, from March, from November, um, and um, actually the summer. So we're doing a catalog um, with uh, the SCM, with light microscopy, uh, use and, and a detailed taxonomic catalog uh, from all the references, so it's backed up. But uh, so then when we have the inventory, what we're going to do is uh, taking taking sections of images, uh, about uh, um, 400 microns um, by 700 microns. And once we know enough of the genera, we get a really, re really good catalog, good inventory of the genera, we're going to be counting and mapping the genera um, on 10 different um, sections of distal, proximal, and medial sections looking and then we're going to put it in we've already got it going into a spreadsheet we'll do statistical analysis on it and see if we're going to start picking up communities arrangements and see if we can actually link that to the barcode uh, sequencing data and uh, look at our um, interrelationships interconnectivity between uh, diatoms uh, and other eukaryotes and bacteria so that is that's where we're that's where we're heading brett and and anybody else listening in so we're, we're just beginning to figure out how to do the counting. We're working on the method for the counting, uh, which I figure is a, is a couple months away to nail it, how we do it. And then we're also still uh, working on the identification of different genera. Uh, some of them are, are, are not so easy. There's not that many papers and some of the, uh, the uh, morphological work is, is a bit tricky. So there's some pretty good programs out for doing the counting. You really don't have to get undergrads doing it manually, you know. <laughs> the problem is the species. Yeah. You need to get at least genera. We want to get the genera. Um, yeah. Um, we're already over time. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But they, hey, this, <laughs> yeah. Time is an illusion, Elaine. Come, come on over, Brett, and we can, you, can, you can help out in counting. <laughs> no, I think I'd find a program that can do it. Yeah, there, there are there are some programs, but um, we're looking at we're, we're, the complexity of this is we're looking at layer upon layer. So it's it's literally like looking down on a forest floor. It's not like a normal slide or sample. Yeah, but you can train it. You can teach it AI, right? And you know, just educate it, and then it, then it would, it would learn to recognize it, and then it will do the counting for you. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it is possible to do. We just have to get we have to get some <laughs> working on that that those algorithms to do that. But. And how many kinds of eelgrass are there? You got an eelgrass expert looking at this too, because that's. I mean, I'm sure each eelgrass has got its own its own communities, right? That's a good question. Um, you know, some of the some of the papers I've read is that uh, some of these there's a real question about substrate, and maybe Siobhan can talk about that, but. 
whether the substrate, the eelgrass, is really that important to the colonization and the types of diatoms. So there's some experiments where you can just put in a substrate like a piece of quartz or a, a slide or a piece of marble uh, into the water and see what colonizes on it. And it's, I think, I think the argument, it's still out there. Well, she'll probably get the answer when she does the barcode anyway, because she'll be seeking from eelgrass while she's at it, right? right. Right. Yeah, I can speak to the specificity um, with pretty high confidence. So a previous student in the Parfrey lab had put out some artificial uh, eelgrass, which was just like a piece of plastic, and also had uh, just like natural eelgrass and also did a transplant experiment. And the microbial community of the plastic and the eelgrass was different and stayed relatively consistent after the transplant too. So it seems like the microbial community is substrate specific. And once it's established, it kind of stays in that state. And we most, see that with most, other... Most community structures in the build like that actually depends on who adheres first. Like every time you get your teeth mm -hmm. cleaned, whichever microbe yeah. sticks down first sets up the whole hierarchy of what's gonna be there until the next time you get your teeth cleaned. So I'm sure it's the same yeah. with the grass. Whoever colonizes first is gonna set the order for whoever's coming. Yeah, it absolutely is. And that's kind of why we uh, actually divided the eelgrass into three different spots because the base is like kind of the newest, most exposed substrate. So we can see what the first colonizers are. And then the tip is kind of, it's pretty old than you would expect a more complex. There is an eelgrass expert in zoology, Mary, um, I forget her name, in zoology, there's a, hey, you can Yeah, okay, so you know, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be fun to chat with yeah. her too. Yeah, Emily Adamchek, who's involved in this project and uh, was participated in that experiment, is actually co supervised by Mary. Okay. Mary's really cool. <laughs> yeah. The first, the first colonizers, pretty much from the literature and from what we're seeing uh, on the uh, proximal uh, ends of the, of, the, of the eelgrass, is the coconius, those ovals. And then as you move up the, the eelgrass, you start to see uh, heavier and heavier colonization of these, of these uh, sticks, these big uh, diatom sticks called tabularia. And um, it's really interesting to see the, the interaction between the tabularia and the, and the coconeus and other diatoms, how they squeeze themselves in there. And um, so that's what we'll be looking at too. It's, it's pretty clear there's a kind of an order to the colonization. Uh, of the eelgrass we're seeing, but we got to work that out numerically. Also, if I can make a point about the microbes that live on the eelgrass and also on us, they're in it for themselves. Like they're not going on the eelgrass for the sake of the eelgrass. They're going there because the eelgrass and the kelp or whatever is leaching like a metabolite they can use or providing habitat or Maybe their food lives on the eelgrass, so they're there because their food is there. So that also affects like what sticks to what is like, can you get food? Because if not, like the microbe isn't gonna go there. It's yeah, but they, they may have benefits for the eelgrass. The eelgrass maybe, I don't know, you know, putting out some kind of something rather than microbes that adhere to. And then the diatoms come along or someone comes along and chews on the microbes. I mean, it's a, it's a buggy bug world. Headlights. French fries with headlights. Yeah, it's called those tabularia. We've got about we've got about three or four species of different sizes that show up on the eelgrass consistently, and they're huge variation range of size um, of the different species of tabularia. That's cool. Okay, well, um, thank you all for coming. I have fun. It's always fun, this piece of eelgrass. Thanks, Elaine. Amazing piece of eelgrass, Elaine. <laughs> it's still the gift that keeps on giving. Fantastic. Um, so, so thank you all for coming. And if you have any suggestions of um, samples that would look really cool under the electron microscope, then let us know. Uh, then we're going to have another one in October. <laughs> and it's going to be slime molds and plant bits. Who knew that pansies had such beautiful sculpturing in the petals? 
Uh, so we will, um, we'll see what else we can find. Uh, so Pam's gonna help out with that one because Pam's our expert in slime molds. And, and it turns out that slime molds under the electron microscope have the most amazing sculpturing. And if any of you are artists in any way, you'll love it. And um, slime mold, we've been calling slime mold, we're part of a, a group that's, that's actually making a book. Can we mention the book, Pam? I guess so, yeah. So, so we're putting a book together of slime molds of BC. And um, so far, I, I've been, um, they're called, we've been calling ourselves Slimies or the, mix, the Mixo group, because they're Mixomycetes. But you grow them in a slimarium or, or a moist chamber. Or you can find them in the woods. Yeah, there's lot, yeah. They're, and, and once you find one, you suddenly the most beautiful, beautiful pictures. Um, okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, so till the next time.